Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Dear Commissioner, Minister for Development, Your Excellencies, dear colleagues, partners and friends. On behalf of the European Commission, it is my pleasure to welcome you at this important event on water and beyond. It is an honor to be holding it together with our co-host, Slovenia. I take this opportunity to also thank dearly our co-organizers, UNICEF, UNESCO, Women for Water Partnership, Water Aid, and Borda for their support and cooperation. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we mark a new milestone for our DG that from now on is called uh, International Partnerships, Director General for International Partnerships. To succeed in our mission to deliver sustainable development and to eradicate poverty, we need to join forces with all of you and build partnerships. Therefore, the new name. With the EU member states, we are working as Team Europe to increase our collective impact. The presence of Slovenia and Portugal today is another clear message of the importance of joint work. Today is an opportunity to reaffirm the importance of water for people, for nature, for our economies and our stability. Water is a significant cross-cutting issue shaping all our priorities. I especially welcome the decision of Slovenia to give priority to water during its presidency of the Council of the EU. Water is a core element of delivering peace, security, and sustainable development. As we start the new programming cycle, it is important to note that a significant number of the EU delegations, especially in Africa, have already suggested water action under it. So this is the moment to push forward our collective response, ladies and gentlemen. With more than 100 countries represented at this event and more than 500 participants, this event is about changing experiences and it is about designing the responses that are needed. Let me conclude to open this event and welcome you all. This event means a lot to me personally too, because it is a rare to have the privilege to present two distinguished keynote speakers, both from the country I know best. These are dear former colleagues from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and now Commissioner Janis Lenarcic and the State Secretary acting as Minister of Development, Dr. Stanislaw Raschan. Thank you for accepting our invitation to speak at this important event. And dear Janis, the floor is yours. Please take the floor. Thank you, Deputy Director General, dear Marietta. Dear State Secretaries, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, my thanks uh, for the invitation to speak to you today. Among the first things we learned in school was the fact that the water is the source of life on Earth, connecting all living things. And it is today that all of us can see how it continues to be our first line of defense for hand hygiene against COVID-19 and other diseases. Despite this, we are seeing only about half of the necessary investments to provide clean water and sanitation to all, the so-called uh, Sustainable Development Goal number six. And that is the case also here in Europe. Just consider the following two figures for a moment. 96 billion euro are needed annually to reach targets on access to safe drinking water and sanitation. However, only 2.1 billion has been leveraged from the private sector between 2012 and 2017 for water infrastructure, compared to more than 150 billion for other sectors. This is glaring statistics and a missed opportunity especially when you think of how every euro invested in water and sanitation returns two to 5.5 euro to the economy through reduced time for water harvesting, health, education, water and energy savings. 
with added positive benefits too for infrastructure, nature-based solutions, and society as a whole. On top of the lack of investment, the number of water-related disasters has dramatically increased in the last decade, hitting especially the poorest populations of the world. And due to climate change, there are more and more water-related issues, exacerbating tensions in already fragile areas. Bearing all this, all this in mind, water must be at the top of our agenda. It is already fully part of the EU Green Deal agenda. And while the European Union is a global water leader with more than 2.6 billion euro committed in the last financial period, we can do more and better. As we embark on a new programming period for partner countries for the next seven years, now is the time collectively to reflect on how we take this agenda forward. Together, we should seize the opportunity to advance a smarter, more efficient agenda, to leverage more financing for water, to build back better. I wish to assure you that the European Commission is determined to work with member states as Team Europe to be more strategic and impactful in our actions around the world. Working hand in hand with development finance institutions, humanitarian partners, non-governmental organizations, public utilities, business, researchers, and citizens, we can spearhead a just and green recovery. The EU already has a leading role in the universal promotion of safeguarding the human right to safe drinking water and good sanitation services. Improving water quality, managing water risks and disasters, ensuring good water governance, and helping ensure the financial stability of the sector. Access to safe drinking water and sanitation is a human right. It is a game changer, especially for women and children, and contributes to reducing inequalities. Indeed, we know that improved water, sanitation, and hygiene facilities, WASH, are directly related to increased rates of school attendance, especially among girls. Therefore, we need to translate human rights to water and sanitation obligations into meaningful action on the ground. As for our external humanitarian actions, the human rights to water and sanitation lies at the center of our WASH mandate. Along with our efforts to integrate environmental considerations in humanitarian WASH actions, we strive to have our WASH actions culturally and gender appropriate, secure, and environmentally friendly, helping to build the resilience of people and communities affected. This should be our starting point. Secondly, we need to support transboundary water cooperation and multilateral action on water, like, for example, the global UNECE Water Convention. In this regard, it is important to stress that European Union supports and ad actively advocates for the fundamental role of water as an agent of peace and as a tool for political and social stability. This is crucial for good governance, mediation, and prevention of conflicts. For this reason, water has a special place in the triple humanitarian development and peace nexus. The EU triple nexus model is implemented with encouraging results. Water has been indicated as a priority area for cooperation between EU services and situations of fragility and conflict in more than 10 countries. Third, we should do all we can to encourage and leverage more investments in this sector. On our side, we will use the European Fund for Sustainable Development to channel more private and public funds towards water interventions. As Commissioner for Crisis Management, I'm also a member of the high-level group of the Humanitarian Resiliency Investing Initiative. WASH plays a particular role here as a priority for innovative finance projects in the sector. 
Finally, basic wash will be included as part of the, quote, at least 20%, unquote, human development target as called for by stakeholders for a long time. As we start preparations for the 2023 United Nations Conference on the midterm review of the water decade, now is the moment to put water at the heart of the international community's agenda and to think about how we make the most of our cooperation. I wish you every success while focusing on these matters, and I'm looking forward to see the outcome of your work. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear Commissioner, for your very valuable contribution. And now it is my pleasure to invite uh, uh, Minister for Development of Republic of Slovenia, Stanislav Raschan, to take the floor. Please, uh, Mr. Raschan, you can start. Thank you very much. First, fellow Slovenians, dear Commissioner Lenarčić, Dear Deputy DG uh, uh, Madam Jager, dear Marietka and Janes, ladies and gentlemen, let me first thank the European Commission and International Partnership in particular for organizing the conference and inviting Slovenia to co-host it. For I would also like to take this opportunity to express my best wishes to the Portuguese, pre Portuguese presidency, especially <coughs> State Secretary, <coughs> excuse me, and Minister for Development, uh, Francisco André. Francisco, thank you so much for joining us. Best wishes for your presidency, as well to commend the excellent cooperation within the trio presidency together of course with germany water is the only natural resource that has no substitute the only substitute for water is water it is renewable but not unlimited and it's unevenly distributed yet compared to other natural resources it is undervaluated as a strategic asset, water requires a well thought, thought and comprehensive approach that would synchronize all re relevant policies, resulting in better synergies and responses to water-related challenges. I would like to thank once again International Partnership for recognizing the importance of water and organizing this seminar. I am deeply convinced that the four days multi-stakeholder dialogue will bring tangible results in terms of better synergies and responses. While strengthening the role of the European Union in the global water landscape. The EU is well positioned for a leading role at regional and global level in addressing those challenges basing its action on the Green Deal global strategy, European consensus on development and European consensus on humanitarian assistance. Water affects every aspect of our lives, economies and so societies, a horizontal issue per, per excellence that defines comparativeness Water-related challenges are often com complex and interrelated with other challenges, be in governance, development, climate change, education, gender, nutrition, or health. Interdependent challenges need integrated solutions based on equitable, comprehensive, and inclusive approach. This is the only possible way to build healthy and resilient societies green our economies and prevent conflicts. What we need to do and what Slovenia will be striving for during its presidency of the Council in the second half of this year is to embed water systematically and comprehensively across all experts and phase of EU's external action. We need to mainstream water 
but at the same time, it is at most importance to highlight water as an issue in its own right. The new programming circle, including the Team Europe initiatives, is a good opportunity to give water the attention it deserves. Continued efforts are needed to reach SDG 6, which aims to ensure availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. However, the cross-cutting nature of water reminds us that sustainable water resources management is a precondition for reaching all other SDGs. There are many challenges ahead of us, human, environmental, geopolitical. The pandemic reminded us that water is a major public health issue. Access to basic social services and foremost to safe drinking water needs to remain a priori priority. At the same time, food and nutrition security calls for a closer look at the agriculture consumption of water. A lot has been said and done in terms of water efficiency. However, we also have to think about water effectiveness. Should we supporting production of food samples in teeth for ex export in regions with high water scarcity? Climate change and various disruptions of water circle are affecting the quality of life in each and every country regardless of its GDP. Scarcity and poor management of water resources not only deepen social inequalities, but also trigger and deepen social, economic and political instabilities. In view of increasing water scarcity, the competing needs for water use, coupled with dramatically growing demands and likely to exer exacerbate water-related security challenges. The majority of the planet's fresh water resources are transboundary. Transboundary water governance is an imperative for an environmental perspective, but even more importantly, from a security perspective. By promoting good water governance and transboundary water cooperation, water diplomacy is crucial in enabling peace and security as well as around development of our partner countries. Throughout history, active engagement in water cooperation has proven to be one of the most important factors in avoiding conflict. We must continue to pursue legal frameworks and joint management for the transboundary water resources, particularly on groundwater, where the legal frameworks are less developed. Globalization of the UNEC Water and Convention is worth the efforts to pursue in this regard. Water represents a good basis for a dynamic approach to conflict prevention, conflict transformation, peace building and resil resilience, as well as to, to sustainable, inclusive development and regional cooperation. Conflict analyses have shown that disregarding environmental factors and natural resources, including water, in peace process sustainably raise the risk of recurrences of the conflict. I'm glad to share the keynote speech, or better to say the virtual floor, with the Commissioner Lenarchic, as water has a special place in humanitarian response and the humanitarian development nexus. Allow me to stress the importance of access to safe drinking water and protection of water resources and installation as a vital element in protecting populations in fragile situations. The COVID pandemic has highlighted this issue even further as the access to the water has a major impact on curbing the pandemic. There is ample space for the EU water diplomacy to play a stronger role in promoting sustainable inclusive water management and cooperation mediating and helping to prevent water-related conflict, as well as contributing to post-conflict resilience by assuring that water is taken into consideration in the peace processes. Ladies and gentlemen, at the end, the pandemic caused many setbacks and put many challenges ahead of us. However, there should be no doubt 
what the main lesson is. We need to strengthen the focus on human development. We are all striving for one final goal, a water secure world where every person's right to water is fulfilled and our planet, planet is preserved for future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister, for your inspiring and excellent speech. Dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, this concludes the uh, welcome uh, addresses and keynote presentation. And uh, by thanking again the Commissioner Lenacic and Minister Rashchan, I'm now passing the floor to someone who is much better placed to be facilitator and moderator of the high level panel discussion with uh, our uh, excellent guest. And I'm um, giving the floor to Chris Burns, who is going to lead the and moderated the, the session. By thanking you all for participating and being with us, I am uh, grateful for your contribution. Chris, to you. Marietta, thank you so much. Good to work with you again, and uh, also with Commissioner Lenarcic uh, as well. And, uh, Marietta, when you mentioned uh, that uh, we have to move forward together, that's really uh, quite a bit of the theme that we're going to be looking at over the next four days, and that's why we have so many different kinds of people involved uh, from the government level, from the NGO, uh, from uh, also from the private sector. Um, interesting that uh, Commissioner Lenarcic mentioned about how the private sector's investment in water is far short of what, what needs to be done. Uh, also with... Uh, uh, Minister Rashchan mentioning that uh, the sort of link between water and conflict, because I've been on the ground as a journalist in a number of places where uh, water might not be the direct link, but it has an indirect link quite often to uh, conflicts and tensions in different parts of the world. And that's what we also want to uh, address over these uh, next four days. So uh, welcome to Water and Beyond, uh, four days of uh, brainstorming and networking uh, on how we can address this issue, providing water in different parts of the world for everyone. Um, I uh, might uh, mention that uh, the agenda today, we're taking the, today we're taking a global view before we drill down into the specific uh, issues, a global view um, of the role of water in development, governance, peace and security. And um, let's uh, look a, a little bit at the tech tips. I think we have a, a PowerPoint that I can show you. Uh, uh, some uh, tips on uh, the viewers and the speakers, uh, how they can uh, conduct themselves over these next uh, four days. I want to make this as interactive as possible along with the other uh, moderators and facilitators over these next four days. We want to get you involved. We want you to send in your questions on the Q&A part uh, of the digital toolkit for participants uh, on the main page. Um, and if you have any tech issues, you, you'd want to send an email to uh, the uh, European Commission invitation address that you got uh, earlier. Uh, speakers, remember to mute your mics if you're not uh, speaking, uh, to look into the camera. Uh, please keep to time because we have a lot of speakers and we've got to stay on time. Uh, when you send in a question, your full name and affiliation, and keep in mind that we're recording uh, for later uh, playback. So let's uh, get on to our uh, first discussion with five speakers. We're addressing the European Commission's five pillars and priorities for international partnerships uh, with water. Uh, on the Green Deal, fighting poverty, managing migration, boosting technology and jobs. Um, the structure of this, it's over the next hour. Uh, we will, uh, I will do Q&A uh, with uh, the different speakers. And then if we have time, uh, we would like to entertain some of your questions that you will be uh, sending in. Now, before I get started, I'd like to do the Slido. Can we put up the Slido? to three questions, two or two questions and one is going to be a word cloud. And as we were listening uh, to the speakers, 
you might be inspired, and hopefully inspired, to answer those questions and to uh, put in that wor those words for the word cloud so that we can discuss that uh, toward the end of this uh, session. All right, I will move on first to the first speaker, which is uh, Serin Yimabai Tiam, Senegal's Minister of Water and uh, Sanitation. Uh, bonjour, Monsieur le Ministre, j'ai une question pour vous, pour commencer. Vous m'entendez? Ah, il faut mettre le micro. Il faut d'abord mettre le micro. Vous m'entendez? Oui, très bien. OK, je vois que votre micro est maintenant actif, c'est vrai? Je vous entends? D'accord. Alors, euh, le Sénégal, c'est un pays qui euh, place Alors, le sujet... Oui, merci de... beaucoup, euh, oui. euh, euh, je, Madame, je, je, Monsieur oui, le Ministre. Si, si je peux poser une question d'abord, Monsieur le Ministre, si vous me permettez. Monsieur le Commissaire. D'accord. Je, je vous pose la, la question d'abord, OK? Pourriez-vous... Euh, Permettez-moi, pour en qualité de... Pourriez-vous nous... <rire> ministre de la République du Sénégal, de vous remercier pour l'invitation qui m'est faite de participer à cet important événement sur le thème « Water and Beyond » co-organisé par la Slovénie et la Commission européenne. Et je voudrais vous féliciter pour cette initiative. Je voudrais adresser des salutations particulières à Marietta, que j'ai le plaisir de retrouver dans un autre secteur, après avoir partagé avec elle le partenariat mondial pour l'éducation. Comme vous le savez, le Sénégal, depuis son accession à l'indépendance, a toujours réservé une place centrale à la coopération entre pays africains. C'est donc tout naturellement que mon pays accorde une grande importance à la mise en place de larges partenariats pour stimuler l'accélération de l'atteinte des objectifs de développement durable. C'est notamment le cas en ce qui concerne la gestion de l'eau. En adoptant l'hydrodiplomatie comme paradigme essentiel, le Sénégal a fait de la coopération hydrique transfrontalière une priorité pour établir un cadre de développement solidaire au profit des peuples visant dans les États riverains. Pour la protection et la valorisation des eaux transfrontalières, l'hydrodiplomatie s'impose en effet comme levier fondamental dans la promotion d'approches politiques et techniques de coopération favorable à l'utilisation équitable, pacifique et raisonnable des ressources hydriques. L'Organisation pour la mise en valeur du fleuve Sénégal et sa sœur, l'Organisation pour la mise en valeur du fleuve Gambie, qui ont toutes les deux leur siège à Dakar, capitale du Sénégal, ont développé à cet égard des instruments institutionnels exemplaires et des programmes performants de valorisation concertée des ressources en eau communes. En ce qui concerne l'organisation pour la mise en valeur du fleuve Sénégal, la mise en valeur et la gestion des ressources hydriques du bassin du fleuve Sénégal sont confiées par les États riverains à l'Organisation pour la mise en valeur du fleuve Sénégal. Cette organisation, créée en 1972, regroupe la Guinée, le Mali, la Mauritanie et le Sénégal. Au fil des années, l'OMVS a fini par se positionner comme un acteur majeur de référence parmi les organismes de gestion de bassins fluviaux. Elle a été désignée par le Think Tank Indian Strategic Foresight Group en 2015 et 2017 comme leader dans le classement des organismes de bassins au niveau mondial. Plusieurs résultats ont été atteints au plan économique et politico-diplomatique. Sur le plan économique, 
le programme économique de l'OMVS est axé sur le développement de quatre secteurs. L'hydroélectricité, l'agriculture, la navigation et l'alimentation en eau potable à travers la construction de divers ouvrages communs aux quatre États. Des éléments de contexte et une approche stratégique efficace prenant en compte les réalités géopolitiques de la région ont été favorables au développement de cette organisation. On peut citer l'engagement politique au haut, de haut niveau. En effet, l'organe suprême de l'organisation est la conférence des chefs d'État et de gouvernement qui se réunit tous les deux ans et qui est présidée alternativement par les chefs d'État des quatre pays. Cet engagement politique de haut niveau a permis une prise de décision qui est exécutée et mise en œuvre au niveau des États par deux organes. Le Conseil des ministres, qui est l'organe qui veille à la mise en œuvre des décisions des chefs d'État, et le Haut Commissariat, qui joue le rôle de secrétaire permanent de l'organisation. Cet engagement au haut niveau aussi permet le respect des engagements souscrits par les États. Et cet engagement des États est matérialisé par la Convention relative au statut juridique du fleuve Sénégal, qui est déclaré cours d'eau international. Troisième élément que permet cette prise de décision de haut niveau, c'est la recherche de financement conjoint pour les ouvrages communs. Et la mise en œuvre des ouvrages de première génération de l'organisation a fini de convaincre les différents partenaires de la crédibilité du programme de l'OMVS. Mais aussi un autre élément important de partage, c'est que dans la démarche, il est recherché l'équité par la prise en charge des coûts de l'organisation pour les ouvrages. Il ce qu'il s'agisse des coûts d'investissement que des charges d'exploitation et subséquemment le partage des bénéfices. La clé de répartition des coûts et des charges dérive des bénéfices proportionnels que chaque État tire de l'exploitation des ouvrages communs. Et c'est la confiance qui a permis d'être établie entre les pays. La notion d'ouvrage commun constitue l'aboutissement parfait de la confiance mutuelle entre les États au plus haut niveau. Les ouvrages qui sont dans un pays bénéficient en quelque sorte de l'extraterritorialité et sont gérés par les différents pays. Je voudrais indiquer en termes de succès, parce qu'on a demandé quels sont les succès qui ont été obtenus pour l'OMVS. C'est au titre de l'hydroélectricité, c'est l'exploitation actuellement de 4 MW à partir des barrages communs qui ont été construits et cette ressource électrique est partagée entre les États membres. La mise en place et l'exploitation de terres irrigables de 375 000 hectares, dont les 240 000 se trouvent au Sénégal. Et cette exploitation de terres irrigables à partir du fleuve Sénégal permet de ne plus dépendre de la pluviométrie pour l'agriculture et contribue à l'autosuffisance alimentaire. C'est le projet navigation dont le contrat commercial a été signé l'année dernière pour permettre au Mali d'avoir un accès sur la façade maritime à partir du fleuve Sénégal. C'est aussi l'alimentation en eau des populations. 50% de l'eau qui est consommée dans le périmètre de Dakar vient du fleuve Sénégal et 100% de l'eau consommée à Nouakchott, capitale de la Mauritanie, vient de, du fleuve Sénégal. C'est le même dispositif qui est mis en œuvre au niveau de l'organisation pour la mise en valeur du fleuve Gambie. Je ne vais pas donc m'étendre sur cet aspect-là. Mais je voudrais pour le fleuve Gambie indiquer seulement qu'un des projets majeurs sur lequel cette organisation 
que partagent le Sénégal, la Gambie, la Guinée-Bissau et la Guinée, va démarrer prochainement les travaux d'aménagement hydroélectrique d'un barrage qui se trouve en territoire sénégalais. Et comme par hasard, ce barrage sera exécuté par un groupement d'entreprises européennes, en l'occurrence un groupement franco-allemand Vinci Adrix. Et c'est un barrage qui permettra de garantir l'eau, l'électricité, l'irrigation et l'alimentation en eau des populations. Pour terminer, je voudrais indiquer que les engagements et les performances et le leadership du Sénégal dans l'agenda mondial de l'eau ont permis à notre pays d'être choisi comme pays hôte du 9e Forum mondial de l'eau, dont le thème sera « La sécurité de l'eau pour la paix et le développement ». Il me plaît de souligner que le 9e Forum mondial de l'eau qui se tiendra à Dakar du 21 au 22 mars 2022 place au cœur de ses priorités la question de la coopération sous l'angle de la diplomatie préventive, de la construction solidaire de la résilience, de la paix et du développement durable. Le forum sera ainsi connecté aux agendas, aux plateformes et aux engagements internationaux sur les ODD, à l'accord de Sende sur les risques naturels et les catastrophes, aux accords de Paris sur le climat, à l'agenda 2063 de l'Afrique. L'objectif du 9e Forum mondial de l'eau est d'accélérer la mise en œuvre effective de l'agenda mondial de l'eau qui conditionne la réalisation des ODD, notamment en Afrique, un continent où l'eau est vitale pour le développement humain. Pour terminer, je voudrais vous inviter à nous joindre massivement dans le processus de préparation du 9e Forum mondial de l'eau pour bâtir ensemble, dans la synergie et la coopération renouvelée, une sécurité de l'eau au service de la paix et du développement, gage d'un monde plus résilient, plus solidaire et plus durable. Je voudrais vous remercier pour votre écoute attentive et d'ores déjà m'excuser parce que je dois me libérer, je devais me libérer au bout d'une heure de conférence parce que j'ai un autre engagement à 12h30 heure de Dakar. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le ministre. Rendez-vous à Dakar l'année prochaine pour cette conférence sur l'eau. Uh, I would like to keep uh, to time if possible uh, for the uh, ne next comments. Uh, I'd like to call on uh, Francisco André, the uh, Minister of uh, Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs and the um, and holding the uh, EU Council rotating presidency. Uh, Minister, are you with us? I see you. Yes, I am. Very good. Um, I good have, morning, I have a, a question uh, for you. You are now holding that rotating presidency and water is, is a major priority of the, uh, of the current trio. Uh, transboundary coll uh, collaboration, access to water and sanitation, uh, sustainable management. Uh, none of this can happen without investment, as we've been talking about. Uh, however, the water financing gap is usually uh, estimated at 50% of the needs globally. How should the EU countries and the Commission operate to scale up funding and better use existing uh, funding flows to increase uh, investment for sustainable growth and jobs, Minister? Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, before start, starting, allow me to just briefly to greet uh, our EU Commissioner, Janis Lenarsic, Stanislav Hask, and my colleague for the invitation to participate in this uh, event, Minister Serhin Bay from Senegal, and also Peter Burian from our EU Special Representative for Central Asia, and Anna Nils' daughter from Waterway, Sweden, and Annelies Avril from Swiss Group. I'd like also to just to mention and to give a special word of thanks and congratulations to Slovenia for completing this high-level event on such an important and timely topic as it is water. Water is also high on the agenda of the Portuguese presidency of the European Union for a number of reasons, and one of which is because we are a country where water scarcity already is a reality and where most of our rivers are international. Uh, throughout the years, this has given us some experience on the matter, not only at a national level, but also Portuguese cooperation has been working at bilateral and also multilateral levels 
in most of our partner countries in water-related projects, building resilience to climate change and also devising local and sustainable solutions in areas such as agriculture and, agriculture and water and waste management. Moreover, Portuguese companies are competing on an, on an unequal basis in international calls all over the world on the basis of their widely recognized quality, expertise and innovation. This is why we also set up a Portuguese water partnership for our companies, which is a critical instrument to help them in their internationalization endeavors. The Portuguese water partnership brings together both public and private stakeholders, including academia and civil society, currently giving advice to many countries all over the world on their water and sanitation policies, regulation and management. During the last three decades, Portugal has focused on water supply infrastructure and wastewater treatment. Due to this committed engagement, we have now 96% of the population served by drinking water and supply services and 98,66% of tap water monitored and in compliance with European standards and 85% of households with physical accessibility of service through fixed network. This performance had direct impact not only on environmental quality, where we experienced an improvement on freshwater resources quality, as well as on bathing waters, but also on public health, where we witnessed a significant reduction in terms of waterborne communicable diseases. But water is not only about supply systems. Water is, uh, is cross-cutting to all sustainable development goals. And water systems are closely linked to climate economics and population well-being. Ultimately, water is about health, peace, and security. It is certainly the most strategic natural resource, crucial for the functioning of societies and overall sustainable development, and for which there is no alternative. The complexity of water challenges demand strong and well-coordinated partnerships that respond in an effective way. With the European Green Deal, the European Union commits to lead by example, advance climate action and set standards for a sustainable growth. And therefore, more than ever, we must have the conditions to participate in a robust manner in international efforts to deliver safe and accessible water and sanitation for all. Portugal is ready to actively participate in these efforts and contribute with his know-how and experience. But as you rightly said, Chris, in your introduction, we need to close the financing gap to achieve better results with our partner countries. How can we do that? I leave you with three main ideas. First, we need to be more efficient. Our action has to adapt to each individual country and set concrete objectives on all involved areas, be them legal, government or management. This also means efficiently running water networks, which is a big goal here in Portugal, as I mentioned before. And we need to be extra careful about its sustainability, consider considering that we are talking about a limited public resource. Secondly, we need the private sector. In pub if public funds are not enough, it is obvious that we need to get financing from the private sector. This is important considering the large sums associated with water investments. This has been obvious in other areas of international development cooperation and should also be the same in the water sector. As I said, water improvement trickles down into multiple positive effects in the population, producing long-term results. And thirdly, we need indeed to make water a cross-cutting policy issue and value it accordingly. We need to raise it on our politi global political agenda and put it in the center of our discussions on climate change, climate change and resilience. Moreover, we need to show that sustainable and green investment pays back. The green transition is not only a luxury for some Western countries, but a necessity for everyone. And this is why Portugal will be hosting in April, alongside with the European Investment Bank, a European Union Africa Economic and Green Investment Forum to showcase that you can have that you can have green and sustainable business models that keep on being profitable, creating jobs and making your country competitive in the international markets. I am glad that Slovenia will continue to raise the issue with the European Union presidency on the second half of this year. From our side, we are ready to cooperate both in Europe and with our partner countries, including in Africa and Latin America. To conclude my answer to your question, I would like to summarize it in three 
points concerning water management. We need to be more efficient and to do more with the money and resources that we already have. We need to involve the private sector and find new approaches, new approaches to financing. And we need to design coherent public policies and put water management at the center of our agenda. I thank you for your question, Chris. I will stay with you for some more minutes, but in half an hour, I will have another meeting that it's imperative to attend. So I excuse myself in advance if I have to leave earlier this panel. Thank you very much. Obrigado, Francisco, Minister. Thank you very much. Let me move on to uh, Mr. Uh, Minister Raschan, uh, who we have been uh, uh, hearing from a bit earlier. Mr. Uh, Minister, are you uh, still with us, Mr. Raschan? Yes, hello. Um, let me ask you, Slovenia has also been acting as a leader in international water cooperation, as we've just heard, in particular around the Sava River. Could you please uh, elaborate what we could learn from this experience uh, and how um, and how to, uh, you, do you relate this to the EU role in international water affairs in promoting Green Deal alliances in the coming years, looking ahead? Minister, please. Thank you very much uh, for the question. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, a little mo bit more practical view on water than before when I was speaking more in, uh, let's say, theoretical terms. Slovenia is a responsible upstream neighbor, deeply aware of the need for bilateral, sub-regional and regional cooperation in water management. We developed well-functioning bilateral commissions with all four of our neighbors and are actively engaged in three river basin uh, international commissions. So besides uh, Sava River, we have uh, Drava River and uh, Socha River. Uh, so we do uh, cooperate with our Austrian neighbors, with our Italian neighbors, and with the uh, Sava uh, River with our Croatian and other downstream uh, 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 neighbors. Bearing in mind the importance of regional integration, Slovenia had an instrumental role in initiating the process that led to some of the far, uh, first peacetime cooperation frameworks among former adversaries in the Western Balkans. The framework agreement on the Sava River Basin was established in 2002. The International Commission on the Sava River Basin is today held as one of the most efficient transboundary water regimes in the world. At tomorrow's session on cooperation and peace, our expert will talk about good practices and uh, lessons learned. Here I would like to point out the following. Water must be an integral part of every Green Deal alliance. The recently adopted EU's Green Agenda for the Western Balkans is a good case in that point. A holistic view on water resources management which includes ecosystem services and circular economy principles needs to be mainstreamed into all our interventions. Water issues are very complex and complex issues do not allow for simplistic solutions. They require specific expertise on one hand and understanding of the political context on the other. This is why we need both water experts and politicians or diplomats sitting together at the same table. Conflict sensitive programming is extremely important. We need transformation action. Water is an essential element of circular economy and key contributor to green recovery as highlighted on the EU's Green Deal and Circular Economy Action Plan. Without global outreach, there will be no global transition to sustainable development. The EU can lead the transition by setting the example, by combining diplomacy, policies and cooperation. We are working hand in hand with international partnership to strengthen green alliances with our partners, notably in Latin America and the Western Balkan. To conclude, EU's engagement is even more important in view of the fact that international investors have shown little interest 
to include water in key long-term investment, including for climate change adaptation and mitigation. In this regard, acknowledge challenges and cooperating globally on circular economy models are an important contribution to climate action. So my short answer to your question would be a compre comprehensive approach to water is of utmost importance to enable the EU to lead the green transition. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, I, yes, you, you spoke a bit more as the uh, Senegalese Minister, Minister Tiam mentioned uh, hydro diplomacy, uh, water diplomacy, hydro diplomacy being very important, uh, not only around the world, but also, as you mentioned, within the uh, EU itself. Uh, let me uh, turn to Peter Burian, who's the EU Special Representative uh, for Central Asia. Um, uh, Peter, do you hear me? Yes, yes, I do. Do you hear me? Oh, yes, yes, I see you. Great. Um, let's, let's look at that region now. Um, you know, water it's a water-stressed region of the world um, where water allocation remains a major issue. Could you tell us how multi-purpose water uses can strengthen transboundary water cooperation? Water as a means of peace and not conflict, in other words, right? Yes, indeed. Um, first of all, uh, thank you for including me uh, into the discussion and, and uh, keeping an eye on uh, Central Asia, which uh, I think, as you mentioned, is a very uh, important region for water action. And indeed, support for regional water cooperation has been one of key priorities of my mandate as EU Special Representative for Central Asia. And my particular focus has been devoted to the nexus between water climate and security in the region. And I'm pleased to note that also thanks to the EU engagement with Central Asian countries in implementing the priorities of EU strategy on Central Asia, there is a better understanding among our partners of importance of regional cooperation for addressing existing formidable regional challenges together and strengthening resilience against internal and external shocks including a uh, rapidly growing impact of climate change. And at the same time, I have to add that improved atmosphere uh, in the region over the last three, four years, thanks to uh, Uzbekistan and its change approach to regional cooperation, uh, and also better uh, political and economic ties among Central Asian countries, did not unfortunately bring uh, about an automatic breakthrough in water and energy cooperation among riparian states. In some aspects, existing disagreements between upstream and downstream countries over water and water sharing arrangements might even threaten those positive uh, tendencies to be reversed with negative consequences for the whole region and recent tensions last year uh, between Tajikistan and Turkmenistan over a construction of Rogun Dam, local border uh, skirmishes on Tajik Kyrgyz border, which were also connected with water and water sharing, is a clear confirmation of that uh, possible threat and 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 um, um, and, and eventuality. Uh, this situation is further exacerbated by rapidly growing impact of climate change, which I mentioned, which together with increasing air pollution are contributing to even faster melting on uh, of glaciers in Pamir, which, as you know, are key source of water for the region. And this is happening when water is still wasted and used inefficiently, practically in all Central Asian countries. So, Ambassador, so Ambassador, regarding that, um, that issue, uh, it, how yeah. can that be addressed? How can the EU help address that issue uh, about the glacier Look, and getting and having adequate water in the region? I think, first of all, uh, as uh, previous speakers mentioned, we need to have a comprehensive approach to uh, the impact of climate change, its mitigation and adaptation. We need to promote uh, cleaner technologies. We need to really explain that investing into coal burning um, uh, power stations is really, first of all, a waste of money, but it's even worse. It's really contributing to this very dangerous phenomenon of melting glaciers. So, first of all, we need to have a very interactive and high-level uh, political dialogue 
uh, to pass our messages, to uh, strengthen our partnership, to explain the uh, cost of inaction uh, in this area and explain the benefits of really doing things greener and uh, building back, back better and, and greener too. So uh, it was uh, part of our discussion within the EU Central Asia Economic Forum in December. And I'm pleased to know that our partners, especially having in mind uh, the impact of the pandemic and uh, all these consequences, are more inclined to discuss reforms and more inclined to look into our Green Deal and different areas of cooperation in building back better. And this gives us a certain opportunity really to use this momentum for a more efficient and productive approach. So, so it sounds like you're I... making some headway there, Ambassador. It sounds like you're making headway. You're getting at least people being receptive to, to taking action. Indeed, indeed. Uh, so uh, I think this is really a very positive kind of notice that uh, or, or uh, experience I, I am taking from our recent discussion that uh, this is not what we are saying. They are asking the European Union to be a reliable and Indeed. strong partner in their efforts to to rebuilding their economic restructuring to to do things better and in a more sustainable manner. Okay, I'm, I'm I'm so sorry I'm running out of time here. I want to come back to you if I can, but I want have two more speakers to go to. Anna Nils' daughter, uh, who is chief executive of Water Aid Sweden, uh, Ms. Nils' daughter, how do you see the effects? Uh, of the right to water and sanitation concretely uh, in your work, and how do you see the EU role to make this happen beyond the legal requirements? Oh, Anna, you need to turn on your, your microphone. Sorry about that. Thank you, and thank you to the organizers uh, of this conference. Very important topic. It's an honor to be here among these distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, so, when it comes to the human rights framework um, at, at Water Aid, it has really helped us in, in our dialogues with local and national governments. It helps clarifying the governmental, um, the governmental obligations. For example, when you work with the private sector, it's not enough just to provide water to people, it also has to be affordable, for example. Um, and we at Water Aid, we were really happy to see the, the EU guidelines on human rights uh, uh, and water and, and sanitation, uh, which additionally helps clarifying um, how we work with this. And regardless of whether you, you speak with the human rights language or not, many of the principles that are key for the human rights framework are really important to guarantee access for everyone uh, to, to water and sanitation. Principles such as transparency, participation, um, accountability, uh, and so on. So uh, we really want to see more of that. Uh, but obviously, um, the human rights framework is not enough. If we look at the progress for the Sustainability Development Goal 6, um, we're not doing good enough. We are kind of off track uh, to reach this uh, by 2030. Uh, so what we, what we are looking for is a, a stronger European leadership in these issues. And I was really happy to hear um, to hear Commissioner uh, Lenarcic uh, talk about the future ambitions when it comes to these issues uh, within the Commission. Sounds very uh, promising. Uh, if, if we look at the situation globally, we still have a situation where two in five people globally lack access to water and soap in their homes. And if we look at the least developed countries, uh, nearly half of all healthcare facilities lack access to clean water. So obviously there's a lot, lot needed um, to move on here. So when it comes to our expectations uh, on the EU, EU is um, a really important uh, donor and, and has a key role to play. Uh, and uh, we would like to see EU continue that role as an important donor and if possible even increase investments further as there is such a gap when it comes to, to investment. Um, we also want to highlight how important it is to integrate it into um, the whole dialogue about building back better, for example. Uh, we want a recovery which is healthy, green and just. And uh, 
issues around water and sanitation hygiene are really essential there. Um, we also, I mean, they're not only essential to protect against pandemics, but obviously also very important to build resilience against uh, climate change. Uh, and um, we would like to stress how transformative uh, these issues are. They influence all other sustainable development goals and they are sort of the basics and it's hard to be successful uh, in the other goals if this is not in place. So, Anna, can I ask you, um, I, I think it's uh, you're asking for more EU involvement, more EU investment. I guess we also need, as as uh, Commissioner Lenarchich uh, said, we need more uh, international investment. And I think it's quite significant uh, and interesting that uh, DG De Devco, as of this week, is now a DG Intpat, so Intpa, which is international partnerships, looking for partnerships with uh, government, uh, local, national, international, private sector as well, NGOs. And, and when you're talking about more investment, how do you propose to encourage more investment from the private sector, which seems to be a vast untapped uh, source of investment, if we can get them more involved? What do you suggest? You mean ways to get them more involved? Yes. Or, oh, that's a bit, really, really big question. I think... Um, I actually have a personal background working with sustainability issues. And in my perspective, we talk too little about how business actually um, influence um, access to water, but also how dependent our entire economy is on water. I think, for example, um, some figures from WHO are really interesting. Um, according to their calcul calculations, um, there's a return on investment on three to one when we invest uh, in water um, sanitation hygiene, which is fantastic. If you invest in, in hand washing facilities, it's actually a return on investment on 15 to one. So I think it's key to really link this to economic growth and successful business. We, we need uh, these basics in place for, for society to work. And that's something that, that uh, business and private sector need to pick up on a lot more, I think. Okay, oh, thanks very much. Let me move on to uh, Annelise Avril, uh, Suez Group. Speaking of the private sector, Suez Group, Senior Vice President, member of Aquafed, uh, International Federation of Private Water Operators. Uh, Madame Avril, uh, from, the, from your perspective, at an operational level there, on the ground, um, when you hear what has been discussed, uh, how would you see your role in international partnerships? Uh, thank you very much. Good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, ministers and uh, distinguished uh, guests. It is a pleasure and uh, really a privilege uh, to, be, to be with you. Thank you for the invitation and for organizing uh, such an event. Today, uh, I'm speaking on behalf of uh, Aquafed, as uh, Chris just mentioned, uh, the International Federation of uh, Private Water Operators, uh, with uh, members all around the world serving over uh, 1 billion people uh, with water and sanitation services. Uh, our members uh, range from uh, multinational companies to family-run businesses, and we serve uh, large cities, but also we provide um, small-scale local clean water and sanitation uh, systems. And uh, of course, we're passionate about water, and we do believe that partnerships are really a catalyst to make a significant progress towards SDG 6. As uh, just Anna said, uh, we know we're not on track. We're already involved in a, in a number of partnerships and, and playing a, a key role. And let me give you maybe a, a couple of examples of them. So, so first, at a global level, uh, we have strong relations with many and various partners, such as the United Nations, the Sanitation and Water for All Program, the World Water Council. But when it comes to innovation, which is, uh, which is your question, uh, many of our members are already working with uh, the EU. Uh, the Horizon 2020 calls for projects, the life programs are great initiatives in that respect, as well as Water Europe. And last year we had, for instance, also this initiative, the Joint uh, Research Center study uh, to track COVID-19 in wastewater. So we would be uh, very happy to see more of these and to see a greater focus uh, on water in these programs to really foster and support a collaborative innovation in, in the water sector. Now at the national, the, the local level, 
uh, PPPs, Public Private Partnerships, are, are performing well in, in deploying and uh, implementing new solutions to increase the efficiency, the resilience of the services, as well as uh, to provide affordable uh, solutions to, uh, to the communities. Um, under various contractual arrangements, you know, technical assistance, uh, alliances, uh, uh, mixed companies, performance-based contracts. And we do also have uh, partnerships uh, alongside with the public uh, authority, with local players to really co-develop and implement new solutions locally, which are really suited to the, the local needs. So let me give you maybe a, a couple of examples. Uh, in India, for instance, the Suez has a, has a contract, a DBO contract for water networks in Coimbatore. And over there, we have a partnership with the Karunia University to drive an open innovation program where the local communities come up with issues and questions and problems which are not solved. And we have then uh, the students, but also the Suez experts and our local uh, suppliers as well, working all together to codify some new, some new solutions. And in Dakar as well, and, and, and this example is very close to my heart, and I'm very happy to be sitting on this panel with the, the Minister of uh, Sanitation and, and Water of uh, Senegal, uh, where Suez is operating the, the, the water and the wastewater uh, systems. Uh, we have uh, the creation of a research and development center uh, in partnership with the UCAD, the University of Dakar, to co-design new solutions, nature-based solutions and digital solutions as well, um, adapted to the Western African uh, communities in the context of climate change. But and I guess I guess you will be, uh, Annelise, I guess you will be at that water conference in Dakar next year. Um, you've given a couple of concrete examples of how things are working on the ground. How do you multiply that? And in mind that, you know, as Commissioner Lenach has said, that the private sector is only uh, investing a, a tiny fraction of what they could, perhaps should, be investing right now in water. I think there are, yeah, you're right, there are two areas where all together we could do better. One is pace, we need to move faster. The other one, as you mentioned, is really to create a bigger impact, is scale. And for me, there are three enablers for that. The first one is governance and regulation. Second is skills. And the third one is finance. The first one, when it comes to governance and regulation, uh, especially for the private sector to get uh, to get involved from a financial perspective, we need to have a consistent and clear regulation in, in place. And to move faster, we need also maybe to uh, to fast track uh, the policy making process. Uh, at the EU level, I will take the example, of, for instance, of the water reuse regulation, which was published back in, in May 2020. It took us five years to get there. Uh, surely that there's a way we could actually uh, make it faster so that we can really implement these solutions earlier on. Uh, then we need on the ground as well to have some supportive and enabling regulation a context uh, for, uh, that facilitate the operation of uh, PPPs and partnerships. And at the project contract level, we also need more room to uh, deploy and implement new solutions very often the terms of reference are very prescriptive and quite conservative so uh, as well. Okay, so it's more at a, a, a regulatory level, but perhaps also from a financial level, right? Uh, right. I mean, if you have the European Investment Bank, World Bank and others perhaps um, sharing the, more of the risk involved in some kind of an investment, would that not uh, encourage Suez and the other big players in the world in water to become more involved? Would that, would that help as well? Yes, I think that innovative finance is still to be pushed. It's still early days uh, for blended finance, which is, uh, which is what you mentioned, but there's, but there's a significant uh, potential, uh, that's for sure, in this respect. Mm. So, yes, I think we can, we can move forward. But as I said, the key is really to have a very uh, consistent and very clear uh, framework uh, for us okay. to, uh, to be able to really have uh, a long-term vision and also um, align objectives. Okay, so I've got about five minutes left for this panel before we take a break. I, I'd like to go to the Slido results from those of you who have uh, expressed yourselves. In which ways has cooperation with the EU on water issues been most noticeable in your country or region over the past 10 years? And we see it's a bit split between
cooperation with the EU has been uh, has been active over the last uh, ten years. Um, let's let's move to the next. Can we move to the next one? We had two questions and we had a word cloud. Any case, uh, as we're going to the next one, it, would anyone uh, on the panel like to? Oh, here we go. Which type of partnership? Should the EU prioritize to enable water management? And we see over what water sanitation hygiene has such a great place uh, to, to play when it comes to the Green Deal. And, and uh, uh, Annelise, I, I see you there as well, um, from, from the private sector angle, uh, and, and we're talking about how uh, an investment of one euro uh, in water uh, has a three times payback. Um, I guess the environment and the Green Deal uh, are very important to you as well. Yes, yes, and, and we are really looking forward to uh, get, getting involved in this type of uh, partnerships and, and alliances, that for sure. Yes, it creates uh, a very nice and supportive environment. Uh, P Peter, Peter Burian, uh, the Special Envoy. Um, Ambassador, what, what, what do you think? Uh, what, are you surprised at all by these results? No, uh, I think mm, they are bringing important points. And uh, what I wanted to highlight, what kind of partnership we want to build, I think it's very important to highlight the partnership which is built on national, regional uh, ownership and, and leadership. Uh, and uh, here, uh, there are many things we can do uh, by sharing experiences and so on. But the, the most important work and homework, I would say, needs to be done by our partners. That's why I, I mentioned the importance of having a dialogue supported, as uh, other speakers were mentioning, um, by private sector investment and involvement of our financial institutions, not only to talk, but really translate uh, our agreements into very concrete uh, projects. But uh, once again, uh, regional and national uh, sustainable development strategies are key for us to be able to help. Uh, let's take a look at this word, word cloud on which areas should the EU development actions, including water, be focused over the next years? Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, no, I'm also happy to see all these answers because clearly uh, there is an interest in uh, green economy, there is an interest in green politics, uh, there, there is uh, uh, green recovery after the COVID-19 and I hope that we will be able to use all these uh, potentials, all these uh, public support, expert support. Uh, we need to uh, actually put uh, a certain uh, percentage of uh, uh, pandemic uh, uh, recovery uh, money in the uh, green uh, economy. And uh, I hope that we will able to do so, uh, uh, also including the uh, water management uh, sustainable approach uh, to everything and uh, yeah uh, a great great end of uh, our discussion thank you so much minister thank you so much uh thank you to the entire panel uh and uh, we're right on time so this is great we're going to be drilling down a bit more on uh, the the specific issues of the next uh, the f session one uh, the next session is uh, at the top of the hour at 1400 cet uh, water as an equalizer uh, realizing impact for human development and the key role that water plays. So please uh, join us for that. Uh, take a little break for the next 15 minutes, and we'll see you then. Thank